Hi, I'm Andy Voller. I'm a freelance light designer and programmer. Um, I started with Verilite back in 1987, I believe, um, working for Verilite, working with Veal Once, um, and then obviously graduated my way to Series 200 system. Um, I did leave for a little while to help run with Saigon, but then I returned at about the launch of the Veal 5, initially as a service technician, and then I was the training manager for Verilite for almost 10 years. And during that time, I then ended up moving, doing some kind of theatre programming because Verilites were being used more in theatre. Um, and then eventually, I became a full time programmer, uh, programming on many consoles. But you know, the artist was one of my early consoles I programmed many shows on. So, uh, first of all, we have the channel select panel. So, the system could run up to, technically, up to a thousand fixtures. And we refer to them as fixture numbers, so we don't ever think in terms of DMX, in terms of like numbers and parameters. Um, and even the thumb wheels on the fixtures themselves, like I can make that like one and that like two. I don't have to kind of go, that is like one, and then that's like 25 by every that parameters. So, each light is its own address. Um, so, I can then just select. On here, I can select ranges of channels by pressing first and last. So it's very quick and easy to work with. So of course we see page zero, one to 100, then obviously go 101 to 200, obviously all the way up from 901 to 1000. Uh, we also then have uh, groups, much like you find on any other console these days. So I can record a range of channels and I can then just store that as a group. And then I can then very quickly recall it, which is pretty much how every other desk kind of works. Um, so of course I can select, say, this field four, which I know is fixed to two. When a light is selected, I then have manual control, which is this then bottom section of the console. So all the encoders are fixed. So pan and tilt, we, there's no soft kind of switching really kind of going on. Something that was always great about the Artisan and also the follow-on consoles, Virtua Racer and V676, was pan tilt is in a really comfortable position because on a lot of desks, you're kind of perched and like the next button is right next to me. So I can focus without having to look at the desk. So I can focus hundreds of lights and it made it actually really kind of powerful. And it was one of my favorite things, um, kind of about the desk. So anyway, so once we've got it selected, we can then move the light around. So obviously I'm moving this field forward, just fixture two. I'll try not to blind us. Also I can control its intensity by turning the intensity encoder. Uh, if I do the edge, it will bring in, actually I'll turn the dimmer down, then you'll be able to see what's kind of maybe going on a bit better. Uh, there's some frost panels that like slide in. We refer to them as the uh, Barbie shower curtain doors, because that's what they kind of look like a little bit. So we can then see that's going in. So that would diffuse the beam. Um, and then there's also a beam adjustment, which actually goes between a hot spot and a donut. The Ville 4 is effectively a bit like a, a kind of a beam light. So, um, we can then uh, control the colours, so I've just put this into what we call three mirror mode. Um, I just do store three MIR. The intensity code now changes to magenta, because this is a colour mixing fixture, it doesn't have any colour. So I can now adjust each of the kind of colours, amber, so it's, you know, CMY effectively, this fixture. So of course I can then mix any colours. I can get really disgusting shades of green. Uh, you can probably even get kind of a nice brown somehow as well sometimes. Um, but the real form is kind of a great light. Uh, so that's kind of the encoding controls. There's some quick and dirty kind of buttons to uh, select things or if I want to flip axes, I can press flip. Um, I can open the iris, it doesn't do anything for a real form. Um, I'll go to grab the real 2 uh, It's probably easier to demonstrate the next set of features. Um, so obviously I've just selected that light. So we have gobos. Now this was obviously very much thinking about very like gobos because um, really initially when the console was designed it was only ever envisaged it was going to run Verilites, not DMX fixtures. So we only have 10 gobos. Um, these white pieces of paper um, are actually covering up backlit panels so, um, so you could actually write and we actually have them. Um, oh, there they are. Um, the original Valium uh, strips that we actually used to write on. So these actually used to be there. Um, 
and you used to then just write on them. Uh, and obviously, quite often when you've got a show that was going to be ongoing, you might then just do as I've done here and just print out some nice kind of labels. So that was your labelling. There's no soft labelling LED displays or anything going on there. Uh, so we only have Gobos 1 to 10, um, so obviously it's probably difficult to see, but and these are not, you can't store them, and they're not like Gobo pallets. They just tell the light to go to, you know, Gobo 7, 6, 5. Um, a, the, a wheel select you could use to change to uh, which Gobo wheel you're controlling. Because obviously when the wheel 6 kind of came about, um, 6C, sorry, uh, it had two Gobo wheels. So it had a fixed Gobo wheel and a rotating Gobo wheel. So the wheel select button and everything to toggle between the two. Um, and there was a way, I think, you held store down to access Gobos 11, 12, 13, 14. I think it was that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I can't remember. And we don't have any fixtures just here. We then have preset focuses, which pretty much work in the same way that preset focuses work on any other desk today, like position palettes um, and stuff like that. So I can, for example, kind of go, I like that position of that light. I can just store that as position 10, and then I'll just move that light over there, store that as position 9. So now I have um, quickly created some positions. And obviously, it will always store what channels I have selected. So we don't have this concept of a programmer, which many consoles have today. So whichever light I have selected, they're what's going to be stored when I do a store operation regarding this. Of course, if I then build my queues using preset focuses, much like on other consoles, uh, and I then update these later, then of course all my queues will reflect that update as well. So how we're used to that concept of presets. We only have 80. Basically, we have these paging systems. So we have A, 1 to 20, B, 21 to 40, C, 21 to 60, and obviously uh, 61 to 80. So there's only 80 preset focuses. That's not many compared to the thousands you can do today. We then have preset colors. We can store our own colors. Again, it works in a very similar system. Uh, there's a few more details about storing colors, but you know, you'd mix a color that you like. That color. I'll record that as color 18. If I go back to white, hopefully that's now color 18. The difference here is is the preset colors do not reference cues. So once you recorded it and you put it into a queue, if I change the contents of the preset color, it will not update the cues. So they hadn't thought that far in advance when they were developing the system at the time. We also again have up to 80 uh, preset colors, but we do have the standard page, which you cannot record on, it's the standard colour palette, and then effectively custom and opener to uh, other further pages just called custom and opener. So you can build up to 160 out of colours. We then have the timing section uh, here. This also gets used for some store and recall operations as well, but um, we get very little information. Uh, the thing to remember is that the desk actually doesn't store the queue data. The queue data is stored in the lights. So each light has its own computer and processor, and the desk is really just a keyboard to the lights. So, you know, when, for example, when I select a light, it just says to, it goes on the network, hey, channel one selected. And like channel one, and go, oh, that's me, okay. So then when I move the pan encoder, the desk is just saying, pan encoder has moved this amount, has moved this amount. And channel one goes, oh, I'm selected, so I need to do something about that. When you then record a queue, um, you know, you tell it, okay, store queue one. Then obviously all the lights go, oh, right, okay, I saw this as queue one, and they store that in their own memory. And then when you press, uh, say, go queue one, the desk just says, go queue one, and the lights effectively open. I'm sure there's a few more bits and bytes kind of going on in between. Um, but all the lights will then go, oh, I've got a queue one, oh, I'll go off and do my queue. So it's a distributed processing system, which kind of means, you know, theoretically, there's no limit because you're not going to have any latency issues. Obviously, you know, uh, the VL1 system kind of used to have a minor problem that because it sent uh, much like DMX, it would go pan is this value, tilt is this value for each fixture. If you put like fixture one and fixture 96 next to each other, you could almost see that there was a little bit of a lag. Um, and equally, you know, I'm sure if you do the same with DMX, you could probably find there's a, maybe a perceptible lag. Although these days with art there and things, it's all running faster than most things could respond anyway. Um, 
So it was a, a you know a kind of a big move at the time to move to this distributed processing. That does mean, of course, if I want to swap a light out. I've got to get the data from the light onto a disc um, because, of course, when they de-rig that light, it's taking all its cues with it. So, the original Artisan used to have uh, two floppy drives, which are now blank plates here. Uh, three and a half inch floppy drives. One was for what we call board data, which was all the desk setup, and the second one was for queue data, and we could store 50 lights on each disc. So if you had a 300 light system, that's like six discs just to save. And basically, you know, when we wanted to save the disc, we would select the lights we want to save. So I'm going to say save digital world. But so we would then go to the uh, queue data menu, and go from disk and do enable all data. It would then basically, I'm taking it from disk to the light now. So um, that light would be updated. And obviously if I was going to go I wanted to save two discs, I would just do the two disc operation, enable lamp cues, and then what it will do is it will then download the data from the light. Um, and actually what kind of happens in this instance is the data comes down from the light, uh, comes into the console, and then the console pushes that data out over Ethernet to the Macintosh. So the Macintosh is really used for data storage, so it ends up in a document, all your data gets ended up in a document, and it gives you a GUI for some controls, because obviously in later generations we could control DMX fixtures on the manual controls, so obviously this is kind of quite fixed, you can't add prisms and things really easily, so they then added the DMX controls window, which then gave you a bit more flexibility to control DMX fixtures. Well, we also have like a topographical view, much like layout views um, and magic sheets in existing consoles, where you could lay out all your fixtures, you could select the lights that way, obviously being the active lights, so it's a bit sad, our layout view. And the only information we know about what the lights are doing is shown us here in the status window. It tells the light's intensity, its intensity, focus, color, and beam timing. I have no idea what preset the light, what preset focus that light is in, what colour that light is in, and something you know the desk is kind of quite simple in a sense. It doesn't really do anything for you, and actually it really made programmers and operators kind of always focus on the stage. You know, I think part of the problem with a lot of desks today is you see a program and they're like surrounded by screens almost, and it's all spreadsheets. And you know, I've seen it where people are more focused on that than what's going on on the stage. This forced you to look at the stage because it, was, it wasn't going to tell you anything else. So, recording a cue, so it's actually quite straightforward. So, you know, we're going to go, we like what these two lights are doing. I'm going to record that as new 301. So I typed in the Q number I want to make. Might be in trouble. I type in the Q number I want to record, hold down store enable and press stop. That now exists as Q301. So I'll just, for example, I'll do both lights, make both lights red and then the back. I'll just record that as Q302, store enable and store. So to play back Q301, I'll go 301. Go. This is kind of sort of like a load button in some way, so it's transferred this into this playback called Direct One, the IL One, which is just a kind of a sequence playback, uh, like an executor sort of, but not really. Uh, there is only one cue list, there's not multiple cue lists, so there's a cue list from 0 0.01 to you're not, you're not <laughs> uh, 9999. So, and then I have to turn on the playback. And then that means it now contributes to the output. We can now see the lights. And now going back to our Q301. Now I can go forward a queue by pressing the up arrow, and it will then go to the next Q302. And we'll see that it's bumping the color and moving in four seconds. And I can see that timing. Uh, it's actually just doing color change in four seconds. Um, so you can see what the kind of tolerance are. So it's doing that in four seconds. The Veal 2 cannot do a time for color change. Its color wheels will only ever bump. Whereas obviously the real four kind of crossfade. Now there is a weird thing, and this was kind of intentional, but if for example I move the lights and I want them to turn off, and I'll just hit this button and turn some off, and I now record that as Q303. So still store enable store. We go back to Q302, the lights move, 
But what we notice when I run Q303, the lights just go out, they don't move to where I recorded. When they don't have an intensity, they don't record the cue. So this is how we could actually like mix playbacks. Because if you have like a, uh, a VL2 chase and a VL4 chase, you also don't want them clashing with each other. So you'd actually record your cues with the VL2s with their dimmers on and the VL4s with their dimmers off and vice versa. So that you then, it was our way of kind of separating groups of lights in the programming point of view. Of course, there are going to be points where you do want the lights to kind of move and turn off. Uh, so I'll just move these lights and turn them off. But we press mark this time. So this is effectively like, it's like, as far as the lights are concerned, it has like a dimmer of like 0.001%, which means, ah, I have an intensity, I can record the view. So now when I record the view 3 3 let's go back to the view 2 and now when I record the view 3 3 We'll notice it does exactly what we want. So that was the what we call mark. Um, so the intensity state has a dramatic effect on uh, basically whether lights are recording cues and whether they don't. If I want to change the timing, like I want the colour to bump now, uh, so I can set colour, time, zero, and it will go to the selected lights. Um, so we'll just do it to the real four. So I press enter, I'll then see that the uh, colour time is now showing zero seconds. Uh, what I'll do is actually reuse this cube. And I'll make it blue. So we've now got a cube 303. So when I go back to 302, I think what we should now find, what we can see it, is the colour bumps and now moves. Um, and that timing will now stay that way while I'm recording any further cues. It's almost like timing is a parameter um, in that kind of way. Uh, one of the really kind of, um, of course we can do selective recall. I'm not gonna go into every feature. We can just recall from any cue. We can copy channel from any parameters. And we tend to do it all through here. So we'd select what parameters we want to copy or recall. Uh, so you can say, you know, I want the color from uh, my these are both doing the same thing at the moment, but I could kind of go, I want the, I want that position. Uh, now this is where I have actually haven't done a, uh, so I select, I want focus. Obviously I select the destination light, because that's that view of four. Um, and then I want it from channel one, copy chat. It's gone to what it thinks is the same pencil. The lights are here are not orientated correctly. So I can copy selectively from one light to another. I can also do the same for Qs, I can say from Q999. I want actually all parameters. That's not the lighting very well. Uh, press selective recall and that'll bring it back. Or I can go, actually I just want the colour from Q303. Selective recall and hit the colour. So it, it's really kind of quite straightforward. Um, Qs, uh, sorry, chases, are built from Qs. There's no effects engine, no waveform. So, you know, our very exciting sequence, as exciting as it is, um, I bring this, this menu is the board menu where you access most of the uh, settings of the console and any things. Um, so the status display, I can just ask who's online. And it will tell, it will show me on the channel selection, um, basically which lights are communicating with us. So if a light drops offline, actually, yes, you can see they go purple if there is status indication. Uh, so I can see if somebody's dropped offline. I can also find out if their lamps are turned on. We call it iPres, current present is what that stands for. Um, so we can then see that, oh, it knows the lamp is on. Because uh, of course the uh, ARC power supplies are talking to the process track, so they know what's kind of going on. If I can reset the lights from here, to force them into a reset. This, we're not going to go into all of these, we'll be here for days. Um, but I want to just program this chase. So uh, I have to be in stock. If you're not in stock, you can't edit a chase. I'm just going to clear that out. So if I just wanted that very boring key sequence we just built, which was, uh, was it 300, 301. So I say type in first queue through, and you see that's now here. Then you go your last queue, 303, and I go enter. So I can now see I'm going 301 to 303. Uh, this is my step time, so I can come out of review and run that straight away. I have to turn on the Submaster, I'm going 
turn off direct one, turn on so it actually chase one is now outputting. So that's now basically running a chase of those queues that we've built. And once you kind of understand the more program philosophy, you can program anything. Um, you know, like some of the greatest shows that people have seen was like, you know, Pink Floyd with the ring of real threes or the later generation with the real fours and all the real fives. That was programmed on an art set. Um, and it's just then about the programmer's creativity because as I said, the desk doesn't really do anything for you. It, you have to make it work in that kind of way. Of course, chases, you can put stop flags in, you can do different sequences. And you can even um, just put one cues into a chase because what a lot of people did was actually use the chase select as a method of playing back a show. So um, uh, what I can do is if I put chase one into auto mode, it means whatever I hit, you'll see, go straight into the chase and play back instantly on stage. So actually quite a lot of people would actually almost like page eight for song one and you go intro, verse, chorus, verse, outro, middle eight, and almost play back the show on here, um, rather than bumping around the cues. Because obviously we didn't have macros or any of the fancy things that you now have on today's kind of consoles, or even like fader pages and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the, this section of the desk never did anything. It was never implemented. Like when the desk was originally designed, which I guess it was probably designed by like 85, because it came out like 86, 87, um, the hardware is the expensive part, and they don't know what all the features are going to be in the future. So they can kind of think of what they will probably want to need. But so hence they built that in thinking that's how they were going to do with some things, um, but never got around to kind of implementing it. There's also uh, these playbacks, BP1, BP2, AXF, also never implemented, never did anything. And this whole row of buttons that I'm now pushing, called the MIM bus, so you've never played the name of the MIM bus, uh, also never implemented. One of the other really kind of cool things about the desk is um, I can um, uh, modify which parameters are playback on the fly. So, um, Actually, we can use our example chase again. So I'll maybe just make it go a little bit faster. Oh, I didn't store it. That's what I'll just use it. Okay, so we've got our little chase running. Maybe a bit faster, but and we kind of go, uh, actually, I don't want to play back the focus anymore. So I can say here, turn off focus, and I can apply that to that um, chase. So now, it's not playing back focus, it's only playing back the colours. So I can dynamically, during playback, just knock the parameters out of the playback. Of course, when I'm recording cues, I can also record cues to automatically do this for me. So it will automatically be like a focus chase or colour chase. Um, and that was a really kind of powerful kind of feature. Um, and it made it really good for busking because um, it's a, it was I bust many shows on it um, because you've got real buttons um, and when you thought about it structurally like you might make okay chase one is going to be all my focus chases and you could end up just selecting different focus like fast focus chases like doing kind of cartwheels or doing tilt waves or doing peel ins peel outs and then I might they will only be focused uh, filtered sorry as intensity and focus. So then I can just select lights and then manually bump colours, go bows, um, and do things. So it was a great desk kind of busting. The matrix section that's then below here, uh, basically you can effectively just put groups of lights onto a fader within a queue, effectively. So um, you could have front light, back light, whatever. So you can just use that for running intensity. Um, you probably used it more when you were running dimmers and stuff. You might have used this point. Didn't use it as much. And these could act as flash buttons if you wanted to, kind of as well. Um, obviously, because uh, the lights are scoring the cues, when you wanted to run DMX fixtures or dimmers, obviously those lights are dumped. Uh, so we used to have interface boxes. There was originally the VLDI, uh, which basically used to give you zero to 10 volt output. So that would store all the cues for the dimmers and then just give you a 37 soft X out. Then obviously later we did the Smart DMX, which did the same, but had a DMX out. Then there was the UDM24, which then added smart fixtures like golden scans and kind of stuff like that. 